So the topic uh, currently working on is cameras. And it's a, it's a topic that's evolved over the years because cameras have evolved a lot. When I first was looking at cameras, they used film. And now, who needs film? The central issue in, in, in cameras is forming images of, of things on the other side of the lens. So it's, it's really all, the story of how a lens works. And the idea is that if you just take the light from an object and let it fall on, a, on a, some surface that might or might not be light sensitive, like film or like the, the image sensor in your camera, if you just let the light fall on it, you get, you get no pattern that tells you anything about where the light came from. You need something that, that works with the light strategically so that each illuminated spot on the surface that the light, well, light sensitive surface, corresponds to one spot on the, the scene in front of you. And that's easily accomplished to a pretty good, pretty well, I should say, it's not perfect, by a single lens. And the simplest kind of lens is just a piece of, of, of transparent material like glass, so, so something that, that changes the speed of light and therefore uh, experiences refraction, the light experiences refraction going through it. And if you cut the surfaces of that material so that they are pieces of a sphere, so imagine you take a big glass sphere and you just slice off a, a, a surface at, at right, near the, right near the surface, you, you pull out a chunk of glass that looks a lot like this one. This, this piece of glass has a spherical face on this side, so it's part of a gigantic sphere. And here it's just sliced off, chop. If I took two of these, we would have it curved on both sides. But lenses actually work fine. There, there are subtle differences between a lens that has curved surfaces on both sides and lenses that have curved surfaces only on one. It's not a big deal. I mean, that's for the experts, which from time to time I've been, but, I, but not at the moment. Um, I'm an optical physicist, among other things. So I should know all the details, but who can remember? OK, so the idea is that you've got this curved surface on, on one or both, both faces of a transparent material. And light undergoes refraction on entry and refraction on exit. And because the surfaces are different on the entry surface and the exit surface, the, the bending is not undone the way it is in a window. In a window, the light bends on entry to the, to the window. It goes through, and it unbends on exit from the window. And basically, there's, there's no major change. In, 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 the light's path doesn't change. Uh, it's been displaced a tiny bit, but who cares? In going through a lens, there is a bend that's never undone. And you can create a, a lens this way that has an interesting uh, behavior, that it takes all the rays of light, leaving one spot on an object. And, and my object, my favorite object for years, has been a candle. So that just the tip of that candle flame sends light out in all directions. And if that's all you had, you hold a paper in front of it, you just see a little bit of candle flame on the whole surface of the paper. You can't tell what the candle looks like. But if you take all the rays of light that were spraying out of that candle flame, the tip of it, and collect them with a lens. So the lens's job is to just take whatever light rays hit it. The ones that miss it, that, that's somebody else's business. But the rays that hit it, it handles. And what it does is it bends the, the rays that hit its top region more sharply downward than the rays that hit the bottom region. It, it, it brings them, it gives them all different final angles after they leave. And miraculously, practically, it takes all the rays, if you do it right, it takes all the rays leaving that lens, that, leaving the candle, that hit the lens or enter the lens, they all get bent back together to meet at one place, one point in space. And if you happen to put your hand there or a sheet of paper or an image sensor, you'll see a bright spot corresponding to the, to the candle flame. Because all the rays from that candle flame that manage to go through that lens all come back together on the candle flame. Is that OK, that idea? Um, it also occurs for if there were light coming off the bottom of the candle, the rays will all spread out in all directions. But the ones that enter the lens, they'll come back together and form a spot corresponding to the bottom of the candle. So that basically, the whole candle will, will appear projected on any surface you put in that, in, in, at, at just that distance from the lens. The distances all matter. 
the distance from what's called the object, the thing that's the scene that you're trying to photograph, the distance from the object to the lens, that's, it's known technically as the object distance. Who, who cares? That's just the name for it. When you choose a particular object distance, the rays from that object associated with each point in the object come back together and meet up at one special distance on the other side of the lens. It's called the image distance, but no, just to name it. And you, you got to be pretty picky about those. And I can show you this. And the way we'll do it is with this, this optical table here. There's, a, there's one lens here. There's a screen here to project an image onto. An image of what? Of these three lamps, which I'll turn on. One, which are they? One, oh, all of them go on, right? Did I, did I mess this up? That's on, on. OK, all three are, obviously, all three are on. So, so we're going to take a, a photograph of this lamp, that lamp, that lamp. They're all at different distances from the lens that's going to do the imaging. So light from this, from this funny lamp here, the, the tiny fraction of it, most of it's lost and doesn't, isn't part of the story. A tiny fraction of it makes it through that lens and ends up projected. It, it, the rays are being bent over here, and they come together from the rays from that tip of that light, come together at one tiny spot down there. Um, there if we, if we, I'll show you. If we try to look too early, they're not together yet. If we try to look too, too late, they've come together and they've already come apart. But right here, they might all be together. Now, you can't come down and look at them here. I can. But we've got a camera that'll look at them. So it's a little, it's a little wacky. We're going to have a camera look at the image being formed on that screen. And to do that, I am going to replace, I'll replace that guy up there with these cameras. There. Huh? Oh. Well, that's kind of bright. Got to dim it's a little washed out. Oh yeah, there must be an aperture in here to darken it. There we go. Okay, so as much as it looks like we're looking with a camera right at the at the at the uh, that vertical lamp, the filament of the vertical lamp, we're not. We're actually looking at the image of that lamp. Here's my finger here. I'm touching the image and blocking it. So that's where we're looking. And you'll notice the filament's nice and, nice and, and uh, sharp. It's in focus. OK? The other lamps are not in focus. Why? Because there are different distances. The light rays from a, from a more distant object were not traveling, we're not spreading as quickly. The rays from, from this close in object, the, the ones that, that enter the lens, were coming from nearby. They're spreading. Uh, frantically, and the lens bends them together a certain amount when, when they go through that lens, and they come together right on that screen. The rays from the more distant lamps, those few that managed to go through the lens, were traveling more the same direction, because they started farther away. They, it's a tinier bunch of angles that make it through the lens. And so the, bending, the lens bends them together fine, but they come together more rapidly, because it wasn't as hard for the lens to bring those, those more nearly parallel rays. They, they, they bend together more easily. Can you, you OK with the idea that the rays coming from a nearby object that enter that lens include ones that were really spreading fast? Because you're up close to the lens, you can catch them. The lens can catch those fast spreading rays. And bringing them together is harder. The lens's job is to bend them so they stop diverging from one another and they actually converge. It's actually called the converging lens for that reason. It converges the rays. Yeah, John? Why is the real image upside down? It's a geometry issue that the light from the top of this lens, the top of this filament, goes through the lens, and just by geometry, it's going to go down. Having started high and go through, it's going to end up low. Whereas the light from the bottom of the, of the filament started low, goes through the lens, and it's on its way up, it's going to end up high. So it flips everything upside down, in part just by, for simple ge geometry. Is that OK? So this guy's in focus because the, 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 the lens struggled to converge the rays from this very nearby object. And they came together, but they came together far from the lens. The rays from the 
other objects came together too early and were not, they're not in focus anymore. They came together about here or maybe even here and they overshot and they spread back apart. How do we fix that? The way I can fix it is by bringing the lens closer to where we're, we're staring with the camera so, we, so that, they, that the images that form of the distant objects manage to form on the screen and not before the screen. So let me move the lens back. As I move the lens back toward the screen, the other objects come into view. Nice and sharp. There's one, there's the middle one, and there's the far one. The, the distant object, the rays that managed to get through the lens, were traveling almost exactly horizontally. They're so barely different from one another, the lens has very little trouble bending them back together so they actually meet. And they meet earlier. They meet closer to the lens than the, than the rays from the closer object. It, questions about that? The, the, this is focusing. This is what your camera is doing. You know, your cell phones now all have cameras in them. Uh, and when you're trying to get the, the, the objects in, in focus, what it's trying to do is, is, is the closer the object is, the harder it is for the lens to bring the rays together. Because those rays include ones that were spreading like very aggressively. So bending them together is tough, and it has to move its image sensor farther from the lens, or equivalently the lens farther from the image sensor, to, to let, give them space to meet up and come to a point. Okay? And this is why you can't simultaneously, or I should say it's hard, to simultaneously get, get the foreground in focus and the, the background in focus. You, you'll have photographs where, where the person's sharp and the distant mountains are fuzzy. It, it's this, this battle between the, the light from the distant objects includes rays primarily that are traveling almost the same direction and they're easy to bend together. Person from the nearby per, folk, light from the nearby person has rays that are spreading badly, hard to bring together. All right? And there's also a a, a, a limit. You come too close, and the lens may not be able to bring them to a focus on the image sensor at all. Yeah. Light, light from the closer object. So as, as I bring, do I have a picture like this? I think I've got one of the slides that does this. I've certainly made pictures like this. No, I don't. Not, not my. The, the closer the, the, the object gets to the lens, so the, when, 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 the, when the lens is over here and the object you're trying to image is here, the rays that manage to make it into the object include rays that were traveling like this and rays that were traveling like that. So the, angle, the range of angles is like this. If I come up like this, now this includes rays that were traveling almost up and ones that are almost up. Those are, those are they're, spri they're spread out wildly. And bending them back together so they meet up is tough. Is that okay? So, so the, the distance between the, the object and the lens matters. It determines how far away the, the, what's called the real image forms. And for any given object distance, distance between the lens and object, there is one particular image distance. And you want to have the image sensor there where the rays are sharp. If you move it out, it'll, they'll be fuzzy. There are times when you want that, like if you want, it, if you deliberately want to have, if you want to fuzz something out, um, that's helpful. For example, photography, uh, portrait photography. There's, it's often desirable to have the person in focus and the background out of focus. And to do that, they take advantage of this. They focus strictly on the person, and they make sure rays from the, from the background, uh, they form an image, not not on the image sensor too close, too far, actually, because it's behind you, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be too close. And they're, they're fuzzed out, and you can do that. Yeah, Rachel? Ah, and, and here I'm playing with things that actually emit light of their own, and they're therefore very bright. But the camera also collects objects that are less light and, and are not producing their own light, but really are just taking light that, was, that, that hit them and is, is bouncing back. So, so scattered, light, scattered light counts. It's just that it, it's uh, harder to see. 
if I turn off those lights, we probably can start seeing some of the other stuff. So let me turn off the light. And now the camera is looking at images cast here of things that are on, across the room. I might be able to we'll see whether I can get it to, uh, to show us. Uh, you, can, you can see the light. Yeah, you can see the light. Um, I can see the circle light there. It's, it's in focus. It's right here. You see it? It's not a source of light. It's just it's taking whatever ambient light. If I, if, I put, if, I, if I brighten it, where's a brightener? If I put a, a laser dot on it, see, you see the image of the laser dot? So that's what a camera is doing. It's taking whatever light comes to it, whether it's originated in the object or was bounced off the object, tries to form an image of it on its image sensor and, and, sh and tell you. Is that OK? Good job. Does the size of the lens matter? Yes. It, the size of the lens has a couple of, of well, the, the, the sheer diameter of the lens matters. The bigger the diameter of the lens, the more of the rays coming from any object, it, it collects. And so the brighter the image becomes. So the big diameter lenses collect more light, produce a brighter image, Noth if you cha change nothing else. The consequence of that, however, is that the sharpness, the focus becomes more acute. The bigger the lens is, the more rays it collects. And consequently, do I have a picture of this? Yeah. I can jump. I, I get so bound up in my, come on, computer's so slow. This, this is comparing a big diameter lens to a little diameter lens, otherwise identical lenses. This one collects rays, you know, a huge number of rays, produces a very bright image as a result. But because the rays are coming from way up high, way down low, if you, go, if you, may, if you move the image sensor a little too close to the lens or a little too far from the lens, so it's not quite in the real image itself, you get a terrible fuzzy mess. Okay, so focusing becomes very acute. This is terrible if you want to take landscape photograph where you want people in the foreground and the background to all be in focus. They won't. They'll all be a mess. I mean, you'll get one, one group, but not the other. It's, it's dandy for portraits, as I described. Sometimes you want the person to be in focus, you want the background out of focus. Great. Use a big diameter lens. Because you get you, you focus sharp on the person, and, and light coming from the background is at the wrong distance is, is the rays are, are include ones that are way high, way low, and they and they smear out the the what you see. So, is that okay so far? When you click the portrait setting on a camera, that's what you're doing. You're saying make the lens effectively as big as di diameter as possible, concentrate on the person, smear out everything else. Okay? What's the alternative? The alternative is a tiny lens. And if you make the lens very small in diameter, the image is dark, which is a problem unless you, you know, sort of boost up the, the, the uh, amplification of the image sensor. But the value of that doing that is that the rays are coming from a little high and a little low and working their way together. And they come together really perfectly, in principle perfectly, at, the, at one point. But even if you move the image sensor a little too close or a little too far, they're still already pretty close together. And they look pretty sharp. So a, a little lens, whether it's real or whether it's an effective little lens, um, gives you a, what's called a big depth of focus or depth of field. You can see, even though there's one distance that's the right focus, it's really in focus, everything else is pretty sharp too. So that's, that's what you use when you, when you go for the, sort of the, the landscape setting. You want everything in focus. It tries to make its lens effectively as small in diameter as possible, and therefore get everything in focus. It's OK? Uh, what other things do I want to show you? Ah, the change in the diameter of the lens and nothing else allows you to collect more light. And the consequence is typically you, you get a brighter image, but its focus becomes more critical. If you change the curvature of the lens, so remember it's chunks cut out of a sphere. The simplest lenses are, are, are simplest lenses are chunks cut out of a sphere. Uh, there are more sophisticated lenses that, are, have, that correct certain imperfections of a spherical lens. Uh, and those are called aspheric lenses. And you'll see these in advertisements for cameras, you know, such and such aspheric lenses. Furthermore, there are 
as the lenses get more complicated, they have more than one element. So instead of having a single piece of glass, they have multiple pieces of glass. And those make other corrections for failures. But what I want to show you at the moment is sort of the difference between a telephoto lens and a wide angle lens. What is the difference there? Well, if I turn back on my bright images by actually letting them emit light rather than just, just send it around the room. So now, now we're looking at, uh, at these three guys. You know, there's, there's the, the oh, it's too bright now. Back off. What I was dialing, actually, on that camera is how, effectively, how big it's di the diameter of its lens is. It's got, a, it's got an internal device called an aperture, which effectively chokes off part, the outer, the periphery of the lens. So it makes it smaller, effectively, just by putting a, 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 a hole with a, it's called an aperture. You, you're just blocking the light from the outer edges of the lens. So I, I got a darker image. And, let, you know, you can see it. So this is in focus. If I if I move the lens closer, I can get the other the other two objects in focus. This lens is what do I have here? This lens is a relatively weakly curved lens. What does that mean? It means that it, that it, it struggles to bring the rays together, and they come together relatively gradually. And you have to go a pretty long distance from the physical lens to get to the real image. It, it's it's got it. It's defined as a 30 centimeter lens. That's its focal length. And what that means is that for, a, for an object that's effectively as far away as possible, the moon, infinitely far away, it will bring that to focus, to the real image, in 30 centimeters. And that's about right. That's about 30 centimeters for the, for the most distant of our object. If I substitute for the 30 centimeter lens a 10 centimeter lens, the rays, this bends harder. This will bring the rays together faster. They will form an image much closer to this lens. And the image will be much smaller. So notice the size of that circle over there, you can see it, you know, it's pretty big. It, you know, it's, in this room, it's about a foot tall. If I substitute the, the shorter focal length lens, there it is. It, it's horribly out of focus because the image forms about here. So I have to move this lens much closer to the screen to get it to come to focus. Where is the, it's about here somewhere. It's now about four inches tall. The, that circle lamp, is, the image of the circle lamp is much smaller. It's also much brighter. It, the, the, uh, this camera's going crazy. It says, it's much too bright. I can't, take, I, you know, I can't see the details. I have to dim it down. So the image got brighter because all the light that's hitting that lens, the lens is about the same in diameter as the previous lens. But it's bringing all that light together in a smaller patch of, of surface, so it's brighter. So going to a more highly curved lens brightens the image and shrinks it in size. This is basically a wide angle lens. Uh, it's, it, it, it puts all three of these objects into a small patch of maybe the overall photograph. And it would include, you know, it, if I were bright enough over here go, going away, ha, you know, I'd be in the picture. And that's what you see with a wide-angle lens, right? You've got sort of everybody in the picture. The other lens is a telephoto lens. If I shift over to that other lens, the 30-centimeter longer focal length lens, the less curved lens, because it's so it struggles to bring the, the light together. Now the image is, is dimmer, it's bigger, it had more room to form, and therefore it, things got more widely separated. So it produces a bigger image, and now I'm no longer in the, in the, in the picture, right? I'm, I'm off the edge. So this is, when you have a camera that has a, an optical zoom, and not all, cell phones, I don't know what they do. Cell phones have, have digital zooms, but I'm not sure they have anything optical in them. But the, even most of the small uh, snap and shoot cameras will have a telephoto versus a uh, wide angle zoom process. And that's what's, what's effectively happening is the focal length of the lens is changing. It's, you know, I could talk about that one too. But they're making it so that the image that when you, when you go to telephoto, they make it so the image forms effectively farther from the lens. It's bigger, it's dimmer, and you get, but you get a, a small part of the scene blown up. Um, and if you go to wide angle, the image is brighter, it's everything's smaller, but you've got a bigger field of view. Any questions about those differences? When you see people with, with 
uh, the, the, I'm thinking of sports photographers. They'll, they'll be out there taking pictures of, of, of a distant person catching a ball or hitting something, whatever. Uh, they'll have a huge lens, you know, so it could be like this big with a front face about that big around. The, the, the entry lens might be this big in diameter. That, that's a real telephoto lens, meaning that, that they're really forming an image about that far from the lens. So it's huge, and that's why they can pick out tiny details at great distance. Uh, it would be very dim were it not for the fact that they have a big piece of glass here collecting lots of light. So, so the reason for, for, for wide-angle lenses, it's pretty easy to get enough light, because you only need a little lens to collect enough light to make a tiny little image bright. But if you're going to make a big image with a telephoto lens, you have to collect a lot, because you're, you're, you're spreading it out over so much surface. Um, there's only a little bit left. So you need a big diameter. Yeah. Oh, landscape. Well, how do they change? How do they change the, the, the effective diameter of the lens? They have a device called an aperture in there. And do I have an aperture here or not? No aperture. Um, the classic aperture is a series of, of little metal leaves that go around in a circle. And when you when when you you by hand, which I was doing here, or or electronically move a device around those leaves, they, they all pivot. And they, each one pivots a little in toward the center. And so there's a, there's a hole created by the overlap of those, those, those leaves. And that hole sh shrinks as the aperture changes. And they put the aperture strategically in, a, in the right place within the lens to effectively shrink its diameter. Location actually matters. It's a very complicated story of why it, why it matters. You put the wrong place, and it, it makes gray edges rather than sharp. Uh, it, it, it interferes with the uniformity of, of the brightness. But they can shrink it down. And in the out of focus portions of the image, you often can see that aperture. And you've all seen it. Um, there's a name for this, like bokeh. Ah, aperture, oh, excellent. Thanks, thanks Al. You know, it's, it's like out of, out of James Bond. Isn't there, isn't there a James Bond? There, you know, the, that's, that, that's these leaves coming in. See them? Woo! OK. Um, this one has, I don't know, 12, 14, 16 leaves. But sometimes cameras will have only, only like six of them. And you can see that, you can see the six of them sort of as a hexagonal thing in the bright spots. If you, all right. You've seen all these on ph photographs, and um, those are the aperture. Well, this in particular, you can see these are are, are poly. They're all polygons. See them? That's that is the aperture uh, showing up because of, it, of where the light is relative to the aperture within the lens and, and forming the image, and you're, you're you're noticing it in the photograph. All right. Um, what else do I want to say about lenses? That's most of the stories here. Um, so just, just to reiterate it regarding the telephoto versus wide angle, the telephoto, counterintuitively, the telephoto lens 
is, is more weakly curved than a wide angle. The wide angle lens is highly curved, bends the light like crazy, forms a tiny image. It brings light together. So close to the lens, you get a tiny image. Bright, bright, and tiny. The telephoto lens is actually weakly curved, which is kind of convenient because uh, if it also had to be highly curved, it would involve an awful lot of glass. Right. So uh, telescopes. Yeah, you, you've seen telescopes that, that you look through with your eye, and yeah, those are fun, but, but serious, serious telescopes are almost all photographic. They are basically glorified cameras. And so telephoto lens, like the McCormick Observatory, has a very large, long focal length lens in it. That, that, that is the job. That's what, you know, big, big piece of glass, actually two pieces of glass, which I'll say two cents about in a second. And its job is to bring light together very gradually. First of all, collect a lot of it, big diameter. So diameter mattered for telescopes because you can see more distant objects because not, there's not a lot of light to collect. You need, you need a big barrel to get it. So you, you bend it gently. You bring it together at a uh, certain distance from the lens. You put a photographic plate there of some sort or sensor and you get an image of the stars. All right? Uh, the big revolution in telescopes was when they went from using lenses, which are turned out to be heroic efforts to create. When you, making a lens like this, OK, not a big deal. You know, lens like the one I was playing around with earlier, this one. You know, this is already getting to be kind of hard to make and have it optical quality. But to try to make one this big around uh, became a life's work. And it, there's an added complication. Remember dispersion? The, the fact that different colors of light travel slightly different speeds in, light, in glass? That means that lenses focus blue light more aggressively than they focus red light. Because the blue light travels slower, bends more. So, so the blue light bends, bends harder, focuses too early relative to the red light. So lenses are inherently color, they have color problems. They're chromatic aberration, it's called. This, how, what's our solution? Uh, any lens that's worth its salt is made of at least two elements, different glasses. One of them bends the light. They bend light differently. And you, you put them together at what's in what's called an achromat. You team them up. And they overall bend the light like, an, like a single lens. But the second piece fixes the color problems of the first piece. And the, the, the way is kind of cute. It's, it's a clever thing, but I could spend too much time on it. But so all, all good lenses have at least a pair of elements of different glass with different dispersion characteristics so that they fit. one fixes the other's mistakes. All right? Uh, just to finish off, other, pe other, other flaws that they've got to deal with in, in making camera lenses is remember lenses uh, entering and exiting surfaces cause reflections. Par small amounts, but um, you don't want those reflections for two reasons. One is it wastes light. And for something like a telescope, you really care about all the light you can get. Um, the second thing is that, that those reflections can create funny paths for the light to manage to get to the image sensor in a way that doesn't form an image. The light bouncing a couple times through the glass and then ending up in the image sensor, like it doesn't have any shape or, or sense to it. It just creates overall glow that, that, that spoils the view. So modern lenses are all anti-reflection coded. They have some, something on the surface of every lens that minimizes the reflection. Uh, eyeglasses have, have that often, too. My eyeglasses have, have those anti-reflection coatings. They're, a couple of ways of doing an annual reflection coating. The classic, the classiest one is to use interference effects to kill off the reflection. You know, it's an anti-soap film. You remember soap films create these beautiful colored um, effects. If you do a very fancy multi-layer uh, soap film, you don't use soap, of course, you use hard optical transparent materials, you can actually get the reflection to cancel for the whole across the entire visible. So that there's essentially no reflection in of visible light. There typically starts to be some reflection off into the, the, at the ultraviolet or blue end. And you can sort of see those, you see the coatings that way. You, you look at them, you're like, oh, it's reflecting. It looks purpley. That's the annual reflection coating showing you that it's only good up to the edge of the visible. And then going to the ultraviolet, it starts to, to fail. So that violet end becomes reflective. Is that OK? 
uh, I was thinking about the, tel the telescope. The reason the Cormac Observatory type lens, why those, those, those giant lenses, these were really uh, life's works. Because first off, there are two, there are two components. You, a, a telescope lens made of a single glass component will have terrible color problems. And you just can't work with it. So they made them a, a, a pair, a perfectly matched pair of different optical elements, often glued together, and trying to make a piece of glass that is perfectly transparent, has no stress structures in it. If you get stresses within the glass, it'll have, it'll have, it'll warp the, the light going through it. And they often would have to form the glass and cool it at an incredibly slow rates so that it managed to just get rid of all the internal stress that comes with having it been a liquid, basically, and pouring it into a mold. That, uh, and then uh, getting it to, 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 to go, come out stress-free was just so much work. So there, there are stories, and lots of stories, of the old, the great telescopes of the, certainly the, the 19th century and to some extent the 20th century. Um, people struggling to make those telescopes. Now, uh, even, with, even with the transition to reflecting telescopes, where they use mirrors to form images rather than lenses to form images, that got rid of the color problem, because mirrors don't have a color problem. But still, forming these perfect mirrors that were just, you know, they're, they're, for, for people like me, there are lots of books to read of the making of the great, the great Mont Palomar telescope or something like that. You know, these are, these are multi-year projects. The Hubble Space Telescope, years of work. And then they messed up on the focal length. Uh, I had to fix it. They had to put eyeglasses on the Hubble. All right. Any other questions about cameras? All right. I'm going to move on. Let me get rid of this guy. Cameras. And go to optical recording and communication. And the things I'm thinking about. Yeah, it's there. I'm going to turn off some of the lights. <laughs> the things I, I have in mind are there are three things I have in mind deal with this. One is, what is it, most of these recording and communication, it's digital rather than analog. What the heck's that? So I want to talk about that. Uh, second part is, the optical recording often involves tiny structures on a, on a plastic, uh, or the, a layer within a plastic disc. CDs, DVDs, Blu-ray discs. Um, what basically limits how small you can make these little structures that, that carry the information. And the third thing is, is uh, Fiber optics. How do fiber optics manage to carry information long distances through some through a glass fiber? What's going on there? So let me see what, how far I can get in those in in uh, the, the remaining time. I'm just going to blast through this. I just want to talk about what does it mean to represent information digitally as opposed to analog? Analog representation of information, for example, of sound. If you want, if, you know, sound. I've talked about sound before. Sound is uh, variations in, the, in air pressure or air density caused by, for example, me talking. And if you want to represent that information, we talked about it with radio wave, but uh, radio wave uh, is an example of a case where, where the, that information is represented in analog form, meaning that one physical quantity represents another physical quantity, kind of one for one. So when I'm talking and making variations in pressure, High pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. The radio wave is representing that by the similar fluctuations in its physical quantity. For example, in AM transition, it's the intensity of the radio wave. So you stronger radio wave, weaker. Stronger, weaker, stronger, weaker. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence of, of one physical quantity with another one. You change the, the first physical quantity by, by a small amount, you change the other one a small amount, back and forth. That's great. We use it a lot for, you know, for many things, but it has a problem, and that is it's not very immune to noise. So for example, the, the, the height of, my, of the, black, the black stripes on my cards could be representing air pressure. And you can see this is sort of, this might be the middle air pressure, you know, average. This one, oh, all white, that's high pressure. This one, um, more black. More white than black, that's, that's a little pressure above average. And oh, another all white? I have two all whites, wow. This is mostly black, this is, low, this is lower than average pressure, and so on. This is one physical quantity, how much black there is on my card, representing another physical quantity, what the air pressure is in my sound. Okay? That's fine until you take one of these guys 
and you put it on the floor and you walk all over it, right? And now you look at it, and it's not quite as certain what value that is. You know, it's, it's kind of dirty. I can't really read it very well. You lose the ability to get all the subtlety in the value that was in, in mind. This so analog representation of, of anything is relatively noise sensitive. If you, if you, if you screw up the, the physical quantity representing the sound, for example, you'll ultimately lose the ability to present the sound perfectly. What's the alternative? The alternative is to make it, early on, make a measurement of the physical quantity you have in mind, like air pressure. Measure it as accurately as you like, and then convey the information from then on digitally. And what digital says is, is we're not going to use just one physical quantity represent, to represent that measurement, that, that, the, the, the sound pressure. We're going to use as many physical quantities as we need. Each of those physical quantities is going to be a symbol, like a three, or I had fun with fonts, a seven, right? You can see those guys, right? So if I make a measurement, the same measurement that I would have made and represented as that one I stepped, as this guy, this is a single physical quantity, the, the amount of black, and it's noise sensitive. If I, instead, before I stomped on it, I measure that, and I'd say, that is, the percentage of black on this is seven, is, is, is 73 point blah, blah, blah percent. And I convey that seven like this, and I convey the three like this, and I use more digits to add more digits of, of, of precision. This is relatively, so these are symbols. They're, they're things that you all, we all agree on. These convey a certain specific understanding. And they're relatively noise immune, meaning that as long as you can tell that that's a 7, the information is conveyed as good as, as, as in this pristine moment. In a moment, though, OK, it's still a 7, right? We haven't lost any information. With the analog, we lost information. You can't read it as well. With this one, as long as you can make out the seven, it's as good as gold. All right? So digital, in short, digital information, digital conveyance of information. You take the information. You don't represent it with a single physical quantity. You use as many physical quantities as you need. And you, the physical quantities I have in mind really are symbols of some sort. The amount of charge on a, on a widget, the uh, strength of an electric field, the, the, the color on a dot, whether a hands up or down. Um, so you use enough to do the job. And as long as the person at the other end can make out the symbols and, and, dis and, and uniquely distinguish one from the other, that's good enough because they get all the information. And my, you know, I have a question. This is a long question. I want to ask this as a question. If you've read The Count of Monte Cristo, any of you? People still read. It involves the French Napoleonic semaphore system. They had a their telegraph of that era consisted of these these signpost things that were separated by by great distances and it could be but could be observed one from the other by telescopes. So they would they would be on tops of mountains and if you want you want to send information, you, it relayed from 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 semaphore to semaphore. And what the per, the first person would would look out there and watch the veins on this on the transmitting device. You know, this might be, you know, this might be one, this is two, this is three, this is four, five, six. These are very clearly distinguished symbols. And the information would go to one person's semaphore, and they would retransmit it. Semi you know, I don't know how the semaphores actually did their, their conveyance, but that's the basic idea. You've seen people using essentially semaphore operations when they're, when they're getting planes in place. Stuff. They're, they're doing this kind of stuff. Ships use these. It's all digital communication. As long as you can make out, you can distinguish this from this, which is pretty easy, even in the cloud, even in the fog, all the information conveys. Is that okay? So digital communication is all about sending symbols. And the symbols can be you know, famous bits represented as, as electric charge or no charge or 10 volts or 0 volts or all kinds of different ways of doing that. But you don't have to look out for you don't have to look for subtleties anymore. It's not 10 volts or 9.7.
because you can't be sure those are going to come through clean. It's going to be 10 or 0. As long as you can tell which, whether you, which bin you go in, little, little mess, little trouble doesn't cause trouble. OK, so that's digital. Second thing to look at is on, um, you know, that's on the surfaces of these, these disks that, that you may still use occasionally, except for now streaming and all that, it's like wiped out CDs and DVDs and maybe even Blu-rays. Uh, those disks convey information in digital form. The symbols involved are little stripes on an aluminum or something like aluminum layer within the plastic. Those stripes are, are tiny. They are so small, they are at the limit of what light can identify, can see. And when, when CDs came out in about 1980, the best lasers that, you, basically you need a laser to make a, to, to, to see a tiny structure, you, you can't just use light from a flashlight. It's too messy, too many different photons and waves, it's a mess. You want a laser because you want a single wave that you can focus just as well as you possibly can at the ther theoretical limit. And they did, they, they made optics that could handle the la a laser as well as theory, per, you know, almost perfect optics. But the lasers that were available then which are based on the lasers I talked about, the semiconductor lasers, so they're related to LEDs. They were in the infrared at that, at that era. There were no visible semiconductor lasers, at least not any that you, that were worth, that you could spend money on, you know, reasonable amounts of money on. So they were in the infrared, and infrared light, because it has a long wavelength, has a limited, um, the, the, the spot size you can create by focusing, even laser light was limited. Laser light, when you, when you take light, I want to I go to this. When you take a laser beam and send it through a lens, we, we talk about lenses, you might think that it would focus to a single point at just the right distance. You know, it's for, like it's forming an image, and, and it would form a point image. Well, no, it doesn't quite go to a point. It goes to what's called a beam waste. And the size of that waste, um, like, a, like, like the, the neck of an of a hourglass, the size of that waste is determined by a little bit about the, the lens and stuff, but it has a lot to do with the wavelength. And that waste is not going to be smaller than the wavelength of the light. It might be a factor of two smaller, but not, but not, not more than that. So the smallest dots you can make. It has to do with this, this effect I showed you last time called diffraction. That if you try to send the light through a tiny spot, it spreads. This is, that's this dot here. That's the light spreading out and um, Basically, the, the more you try to confine it, the, the more you, it subsequently blasts out sideways. And you basically cannot bring it down to a spot smaller than a certain size. And if you're trying to identify little patches on the surface, on the metalized surfaces within these disks, going back to these guys, you can't see structures much smaller than the wavelength of light. The disks have a little bit of an advantage in that they, they're operating within plastic, and light travels more slowly in plastic. And when you send a, a red light into, into plastic, its frequency doesn't change, but its wavelength shrinks, because the light slows down. So the wavelength of light in plastic is smaller than it is in glass, and you can therefore actually resolve smaller structures inside plastic than you can resolve outside in the open air. But they get to the limit. So CDs wrote the data as small as they could. They made the symbols as little as they could see with, with the lasers of that era, which were in the infrared. 20 or so years later, DVDs could use red lasers. And they could see smaller structures, and you could put more data on them. And now, with blue lasers, Blu-ray discs, the wavelength's shorter. You can see smaller structures still, so they can put five or 10 times as much data on the disk. So they're, they're right up against the limit of what is possible each time in writing data. They can't, if they make the data any smaller, they can write it, but you can't read it with a laser because the laser can't see the structures. So um, all right. Well, these fiber optics, and I'll do fiber optics on Friday.